The impact of Israeli policies on Palestinians in the occupied territories is dominating the headlines. But in the southern part of Israel, another Arab community has been struggling to stay on land they call home. I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal. Today, a look at the challenges the Bedouin face and Israel's efforts to relocate residents of what they call unrecognized villages. The footage you just saw there was from the village of Am al Haran, which is one of many Bedouin villages in southern Israel that the government has been trying to level and replace with Jewish communities. Adala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel, reports that there are around about 200,000 Bedouin living in the Negev desert, with at least 80,000 living in dozens of unrecognized villages. Now, Bedouins say that obtaining permits to legally build homes and develop basic infrastructure for electricity and water is nearly impossible in these communities and without building permits many of these villages are slated for demolition with varying data from NGOs and government statistics it's hard to quantify the actual number of Bedouin demolition demolitions that have taken place over the years the Israeli government says many of these homes were built illegally on state land they recently approved a five-year plan they say will help integrate these communities into Israeli society. But according to Adala, the Bedouin have been living on the disputed lands for decades. And some fear the government's new plan is just a repeat of earlier efforts to displace thousands of Bedouin to make room for new development projects. Well, to help us talk about this, we're joined by Amir Abu Qaider. He's a Bedouin activist in Be'er Sheva, Israel. Dov Lieber is the Arab Affairs correspondent for the Times of Israel in Tel Aviv. Nadia Ben Yusuf is the U.S. representative of Adala, that's the Legal Center for Arab and Minority Rights in Israel. She's coming to us from the U.S. state of Hawaii. And Emmanuel Miller. He's a political analyst in Jerusalem. It's good to have you here, everybody. Just so people watching around the world can get a really good sense of where are we geographically. Have a look on my laptop. I'm just going to take you into the Negev. A couple more clicks here. The little areas in red, unrecognized villages. The little areas in blue, the circles, recognized villages. And the little blue squares, a Bedouin town or Bedouin towns. This is your, your beat, Dove. If we went down on the ground, what would we see? How do Bedouins live in these recognized villages, unrecognized villages, Bedouin towns? What's the best way to describe it? Well, you ask me, it might be, but I mean, there's someone who comes from these towns, but I mean, some of them, as, as we know, they don't have, uh, those that are unrecognized, they don't have state infrastructure, access to regular water, schools. Uh, anything that you, the state would uh, build uh, in a village, and those that are recognized do have those things. Uh, in the unrecognized villages, some of the homes are shanty shacks built out of metal, uh, uh, kind of uh, metal shacks, and some of them are built out of cement. Uh, that, that's basically what you find. You make it sound very matter of fact. Uh, Amir, is, is that the attitude that Israelis have towards Bedouin communities? Bedouin community is normally portrayed in Israeli uh, mainstream media as trespassers, uh, thieves, despite the fact that we are living in our in our homeland for generations and we were not we haven't immigrated from uh, from uh, abroad to this uh, uh, to our villages. Um, there are uh, tens of uh, unrecognized villages. Uh, which lack any uh, infrastructure, uh, any services, um, and also the so-called recognized localities, they also rank lowest within the Israeli social economic ranking. Yeah. So the situation within the uh, localities is not that uh, prosperous as some people <laughs> would like to um, hint. Sure. And let me just share with people, again, back here on the website of the Knesset.gov, actually says here under Bedouins in the State of Israel, the Bedouin population is ranked at the bottom of the social economic ladder in Israel. Bedouins living in unrecognized settlements, even worse. That's from the government website. Malika. Well, this is from a government Twitter account. This is the Prime Minister of Israel's Twitter account, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, who writes, the Bedouin public is part of us. We want to integrate it into Israeli society 
and not radicalize and push it away from our life experience. So that's one view. On the other hand, though, we got a tweet in from our community member, Nafizi, who says, if only Israel would value the Bedouins as much as it values their voluntary military service, if only it would guarantee their welfare. Nadia, you see these two views here, and I know, of course, you work on the ground with Bedouin communities. Is this your view? Is it similar to Nafizi's here, that they're not valued? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it's exactly right and it's not necessarily because of the service that they offer but it's because they are citizens of Israel so I think it's important to step back again and look at that map that um, Femi showed we're inside Israel we're in the southern part of Israel these are citizens of Israel so we're not talking they deserve rights because of something that they did or something uh, something that they serve whether that's in the military or otherwise but because they are citizens and because our people are uh, should be guaranteed equal rights on that basis and that means agency in terms of where to live, conditions of life, exact same you know, level of um, services as any other uh, citizen of the state. Uh, Amelia, I'm just wondering, is there a sense of us and them with Bedouins and Israelis, the Bedouins who are living in Bedouin communities and then Israelis who maybe don't understand their way of life? Do you get that sense? I think with anybody who's living um, primarily in a city or a town, and then people who are living out there in, in the desert, there's going to be a disconnect because of different services and it's just a different way of life. But I can tell you that I went to Umm al Qiran earlier this week to go and see what, um, what they live like. And um, I think it's very important to experience um, life from their side and see what, um, see what they go through. Mm. And what I can tell you, which is very interesting, and I think we can agree um, in idea with what Nadia just said just now, that everybody should uh, be able to live life um, in dignity and there should be equal rights for all. Um, and I think there's a significant room for improvement, and I think it's a fantastic move forward that the, st the state is offering an almost $100 million package to improve the infra infrastructure, to improve the roads, improve um, the um, health services, and there's certainly a step in the right direction. Right. So, Emmanuel, those are actually in the recognized towns. So, as you saw the map, you have about 35, 36 unrecognized villages, seven government-planned townships that were established in the starting in the 60s, and around 11 recently recognized towns. So, those were recognized around 2003, but yet don't have any of still are missing basic services. So, the the government plan is really about those seven townships and the recently recognized villages, so not about the unrecognized villages. So it still has that displacement mentality, the ideology of the state to remove those people forcibly from their homes and into these villages. Emmanuel, I actually looked at your Facebook site because you just came back from your trip to Am al Haran. Show me some of these pictures. I'm going to show you the pictures. You can tell me what you saw and what was you were thinking as you were taking the pictures. Can you see this one? Oh, yes, I can see it. Um, I've got a very bad screen here, but yes, it's, uh, it was a rainy day and it was my first time there. Um, I was intrigued to see their way of life, how the roads were not paved, how there were some real homes, as you can see in the previous picture, and that's now Khura, um, the town that's been built for the Bedouin. Um, and you can, as you can see in that picture in Khura, the, the life is a lot better in terms of you know, the buildings, um, much bigger buildings, uh, much better roads, the roads are paved, the road, the Roads actually have names there, um, and in fact, um, a tremendous amount of money has been poured into Khura. But if you want to talk about Omar al-Khiran, um, when I was there, I was taken by um, Rabbi Eric Asherman, who used to previously head Rabbi for Human Rights. Um, and we had a good conversation on the way there, and he was telling me that in the 2000s, um, there were flash floods, and three girls were swept to the death in, in uh, Omar al-Khiran. And the situation was so bad that then the um, infrastructure minister, Ariel Sharon, somebody with a checkered history, um, said that this cannot be. And he provided money out of his own coffers to um, give the Bedouin there more steady homes that would be more resistant. But in general, I think it's very concerning. You go there and you realize that these are not conditions that people can really live in long term. And there doesn't need to be an upgrade. And I think that's what the towns, that's, that's not what I think, that's certainly what the government is saying. These are what the towns are designed for, that they can live in places that are that can withstand the elements, that they can have access to proper services. Um, and we can. there's one way of putting it, which um, Nadia just said, about displacement. And another way of putting it is giving the Bedouins a greater quality of life. But why, why wouldn't you give them a, a, a chance of better life in their own villages? Why should Bedouin live they're in, in cities? I mean, this I think don't, don't want to say about this. Wouldn't really help the people. You can't, you can't I mean, build you really anywhere. 
provide services you for can't people. build they anywhere you know and no, no. leave them leave them uh, uh, retain their uh, traditional way of life and not just imposing uh, a totally different way of life so it's interesting them. you say it's not, it's way not of really life. helping when I was at them, not helping them by demolishing their houses you're not helping them by concentrating them uh, concentrating them uh, in impoverished localities i mean if you want to help those uh, to help the Bedouin community. You have to respect our tradition to allow us uh, uh, live uh, okay. uh, on lifestyle. That's a fair claim, and I'd like to respond to that. It, it, it's okay. not. I mean, it's not fake. This is basically the truth that the government, the only planning pattern that we are allowed to have, is basically cities. And other Jews who live in, in in the vicinity, they have they can live in a community, they can live in a city, they can live in township. Why don't we have those options? Why we as I as, as Bedouins? Okay, as you are the question. I'd like to respond to that. Don't can't practice our own way of life and should be uh, should be. Okay, uh, you've said that a few uh, times, and I want to respond to this claim that you want to practice your own way of life. When I was in Umar Khiran, I was told that the people there are mostly um, people with professions. They're not farmers. They're doctors. There's teachers. Um, these are people who are educated, and they are not. In fact, when I was there, I didn't see very many um, cattle grazing in the area around it. So when you're talking about a traditional way of life, but, but Umar, this is the result, the, very least, your, the, the result of the government I'd like, policy. I'd like to respond to your claim. This is the result like of the government policy. I mean, you already they, I, they already I, destroyed I our communities, and, and and for that reason, and, the pe people yeah. can't rely anymore Umar on agriculture. Runs. So Amir and Emmanuel, I'm actually I'm going to jump in here because I want to give our audience a, 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 a chance to weigh in as well because they're they're hearing this argument and they fall on both sides. Uh, this is Benjamin, who I think would agree with Amir. Benjamin says there is no such thing as integration in Israel. The Bedouin community will be locked up in encampments and their culture will be decimated. Someone else takes this a step further. This is an international perspective uh, that Phil is coming to this from. He says this is reminiscent of forced evictions that the apartheid regime carried out against our parents down here in South Africa, which is pretty much what Israel is doing, Phil says, expelling Bedouin Palestinians and demolishing homes to make way for Jews. Dove, is that how you think uh, uh, people see it? And, and in, in your reporting, when you talk to people, is, is this how it's seen? Uh, obviously, there's a large uh, people in the Bedouin community and the large Arab community here in Israel that do see it that way. It's not doesn't mean it's necessarily the case. Obviously, that it is it is how it's perceived by some of the people here. Uh, it, it, to me, it, that doesn't seem the problem at all. I, I would not connect it to larger issues of colonialism. Uh, I, I would not agree with that it's a continuation of uh, displacement of Palestinians since 1948. It has to do with Israel has a serious problem that it has to go by the book. It has to do things legally. And when you... Uh, when you want to recognize a village, and it has recognized some of the villages, much less to recognize 11 villages, and uh, there's still 36 that were unrecognized, and why they recognize some and why they don't recognize others isn't exactly clear. But Doug, that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, how, do, how does a village yeah. become recognized, a village that may have been there for decades and decades, and it, actually before even Israel so, was Israel? Uh, how, so how do you recognize that something that was there before Israel was Israel? Right, okay. There are still land deeds in this country. For the Bedouin here, it usually goes back to Ottoman times. Mm. Okay, before the British Mandate, we're talking about uh, over a century ago. Okay, and what happens is that when these Bedouin villages go to the courts, okay, to prove it's their land, they often lose because they always lose. Uh, I, they always lose. Yes. They, okay. They always lose. There you go. They always lose. Why? Because they don't have the proper documentation, and they lose in court. And, uh, Dove, why are you why are you why are you smiling? Because this to me feels like a deeply deeply upsetting situation. If you're if you're uh, yeah, of course trying to get your village each, recognized, each, uh, each each demolition is a human tragedy, and I think the onus is to make a sensible and more fair policy there, for the better. There Obviously, are people who are responsible for this tragedy. There is a, a policy. It's. A, a, it's not a catastrophe uh, fr from uh, from the sky. It's it's. There are people who think, who plan 
to uproot our community, to re relocate, you know, this word, to relocate our community and concentrate them in, 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 in impoverished localities. And in order to make, uh, to, to, to make the space free for uh, uh, Jewish settlements. I mean, I, I would like to ask yeah. why are not, Jewish not settlements always, not in, in, space, are provided settlement. with, uh, with roads, provided with electricity, with everything? I mean, with. Uh, I mean, let me just let uh, me just hear what. In, I, I, in, I, I, I hear very clearly, that. Amir, where you're, where you're coming from. I hear you loud and clear. Uh, Duff, you're saying this is not always the case. You're saying it's not always about prejudice. What is it about? It's not, uh, it's, sometimes the state just goes by the law. Uh, could, the law could, is could the, always could right the law, here, too. Could the law be prejudiced? Is that possible? Uh, yes. No. So let me, let, let me ask a, a, a legal expert. Nadia, is that possible that it could prejudice could be built, built into the law? Absolutely. So the law is a tool of the powerful. The law is a tool of the system, and the system is designed, the system in Israel is designed to privilege the rights of Jewish people over the rights of non-Jews in the state. So what you see is the Can law I as an instrument of the state. So in the case of Woman Heran, which is the most racist decision that we've seen out of the Israeli Supreme Court, which is to demolish a Bedouin home and establish a Jewish home, Jewish village on top of it, so establish a Bedouin village, establish demolish a Bedouin village, establish a Jewish village on top of that, and the, the Supreme Court greenlighted it. So the Supreme Court, the judiciary, is part and parcel to the, to the institutions of the state and moves these racist policies forward. And I would say that it isn't exactly settler colonialism. It is exactly the Nakba continuing, which is the ideology of the, the state of Israel, was to take the land, to displace the Palestinians, to have the most amount of land for the Jewish people at the expense of all others. And so you're seeing that happen in such an explicit way in the Nakab. So I think, in fact, it is a very easily distilled okay. issue can I, that can I the please state respond of Israel that? is, and is I would taking like to go over and say something land. Can, can, I please respond, can I please respond to that? It is, it is absurd to claim that the Supreme Court is a tool of Israel's government. It's absurd, OK? Israel's Supreme Court is considered by most right-wing people in this country to be an obstruction to the will of Israel's right-wing government, okay? Yes. And I, I recently met with the mayor of Sawad, okay, a Palestinian mayor, who was in charge of uh, finding the land documents, okay, for the Amona evacuation, an Israeli uh, outpost that was recently evacuated, okay? He got the documents. He won in the Supreme Court. The, 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 village, the Jewish outpost was evacuated in the West Bank, and now he sings the praises of Israel's Supreme Court. He finds it just. He finds there's justice there, but the problem is, is that these Bedouin don't have the same documents that they had in the West Bank. The West Bank they had Jordanian documents. Okay, so and that's very difficult. Now, obviously, Israel has to figure out a policy to deal with this. It has to figure out a more humane solution. Okay, and, and you know, those I that it's that's done quite before, possible. Oh, Emmanuel, take there's something. Go. There's something that's very. There's something I think is missing from this conversation. We keep on talking about racism. We keep on talking about oppression and apartheid and all these all these words and i'd like to go and talk about a few other things you know is this only happening to bedouins does israel pull out um jews does it move jews and relocate them absolutely does i can tell you that there are eight thousand jews who are living in the gaza strip and they were relocated in those 2000, are, those are illegal 2005. Settlements under international law. Uh, I, didn't to I would like i would like to finish my point i want to hear you i really want to hear you but let's keep it between um, a bit civil thank you so in 2005, yes, we can discuss the reason why they were moved, and you can have your claim, and I'm not going to go and dispute that right now, but we can just say, that in terms of the, just humanity, these people were promised homes, and it, the fact is, even now, 30% of them are still living in mobile homes. I can tell you, as a Jew of Iraqi descent, that my grandfather came here in the 1950s, and whole, um, close to a million Jews came from the uh, Middle East to Israel, and many of them lived in transit camps, in tens years ago, um, in Israel, I, I'm not just—it's—it's not—it's not, it's not about how long ago it was. About the the treatment they received, and in ma and in many ways, the treatment they received is very similar to what we're talking about with the um, Bedouin now. And it's not—it's not about racism against the Bedouin. I think this uh, problem with Israel as a state in that it's very bad at planning these things. Yeah, so it's very. It's I can very talk about this personal it's, experience, and I think I can I can empathize with very, you because I think yeah, it's we, very, can, we can we can connect over this. It's not it's not necessarily a hatred or a, a desire to go and move you out, but it's also a, a plan that's being put forward. And yeah, you can have some serious objections to that plan without it being necessarily racism. 
So I want to bring in a couple of tweets here from people who are listening to this conversation uh, and responding. Uh, first of all is one that's from earlier. This is Israel Peace Blog, who writes, the government is trying to deal with the Bedouin issue in a mostly positive way, or at least better than past governments, so qualifying a little bit there. Uh, but members of our community write, in the Bedouin communities, Israel regularly denies planning proposals. So that's one of the obstacles. Uh, they go on to say, uh, it seems like a boring planning issue at times, but it really gets to the heart of the conflict. This is about rights, and this is about recognition. As for the Bedouin, it's also about rights and recognition of their tradition and ways of life and right to a home. Amir, when you, you read this from Garrett Khoury on, on Twitter, what do you think? It's uh, it's also about our historic historical uh, rights to have uh, um, to, to live a, a decent life, but it's also part of our citizenship in in, in Israel. It's not just uh, uh, about uh, the far far history and and, and tradition. It's also about uh, um, fulfilling our citizenship within Israel and demanding equality with with others. And when, when when they say that Israel is is bad at planning, I see Israel planning excellent uh, uh, towns and places for 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 Jews. So it's not uh, an accident that when when it comes to Bedouin, Israel is bad with planning. Amir, I got we got this tweet from Northern Judy. I, I, I'm intrigued as to how you might respond to it. Why would anyone prefer freedom of desert land over tiny Israeli apartments? What do you think? I think uh, we have the right to practice our way of life, and and uh, it's not just about um, some nostalgic way of life for seeking freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's about people having had a roof be, 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 be beyond their head. It's something. Mm -hmm. I mean. We are not talking about any privileges. We are talking about the right to have your own home and houses are being demolished every every single day. So it's Nadia, not, when you, know, you, hear, when you hear the word integration, what does that mean to you? Is it a code or is it just uh, an idea of better infrastructure uh, in places that it's easier to provide infrastructure? That's right. I mean, integration is it is. It's a code word for displacement, and and it also has a, a tinge of, of racism in there. I know that Emmanuel is going to the pushback on on words like racism and oppression, but uh, integration assumes also that the Bedouin are these kind of backwards, savages, primitive, which is very colonial language. The idea that the native is somehow barbaric, needs to be modernized, needs to be integrated, and the Bedouin are saying, no, we are modern. We are living with you here in 2017. There's no such thing as needing to be modernized in order, needing to be urbanized in order to be modernized. We are living with Wi-Fi. And, I mean, you went to Umm al-Hiran, you have solar panels, you have um, Wi-Fi, you have tele, you have all of the, the so, sort of so-called yeah. modernity. And, and yet the idea that we need to integrate them has this sense of stereotype about who the Bedouin are. And the Bedouin are saying simply, let us remain on our land. Let us have equal rights integrate, to the, miss, to the Jewish farmers. So you end, talk about integration, we're talking about, I mean, about connecting are, them to the infrastructure. These are the desert's the first farmers, right? And they're asking to live in agricultural villages, asking to live in rural communities. And if you're a Jewish citizen, as, as Amir said, you can live in a city, you can live in an individual farm, you can live in a kibbutz, in a moshav, you can live in a rural town. You. And I the Bedouin you. don't have that choice they're at they're being so forced have to two, move into I have cities and these are farmers and so okay. i think that Yes, so go ahead. So, Emmanuel, I'm going to ask, okay, you, to your, ask you to take your points to our post show because I'm taking all of the guests there because then you, I won't have to rush you because we're literally less than a minute left to this main live show. So, Emmanuel Miller, <laughs> Nadia Ben Yusuf, uh, and also Dove Lieber and Amir Abuqueda, we're going to take you all online. So, if you're watching on TV, go online to stream.aljazeera.com. If you're already online, you need to go to our special page as well. And I want to also thank Christina Thornall, Tola Brennan, and Donna Alaudi, who actually provided some of the video you saw much earlier in our program from Amma al Haran. Meanwhile, Malika, what do you have online? Uh, ending thoughts from James, who says, was that a long-term plan acceptable to both local Bedouin and to the Israeli state? Um al Haran, which we saw demolished, will simply be rebuilt. To be continued. Hashtag AJ Stream if you want to be part of that conversation. We'll see you in the post show. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.
Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're watching our online post show. We're discussing the challenges that Bedouins in Israel face. I want to get right back to it. I'm actually going to ask all of you, you guests, where do you go from here? Because I'm not hearing animosity between you necessarily. I'm just hearing you've got a different way of looking at it. I'm, I'm being very upbeat version of what I'm hearing and maybe what you're thinking. But I'm not hearing that there's... Hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how you resolve this situation. And Manu, I know you, you wanted to kick off because you had a couple of points you wanted to make and we were right at the end of the live show. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the things I was going to respond to Nadia was that she mentioned and um, that we are not um, all backwards and that would be a racist thing to assume, and I agree. Uh, when I was in Omar and I got to meet people and I understood that um, these people are professionals and they have um, good jobs as teachers and um, you know, they're not, you know, all farmers, far from it. Um, and I think that ties in and there's, an, and there's an inherent contradiction between saying we have to preserve our way of life as people who live um, as farmers and then saying, but when not all backwards and we're not all farmers. Um, these people, as, as clearly, they're not they're, they're professionals, and therefore there's no problem if they would, if if they can, if they want to, they, for them to move into a town. If they want to stay in in a village, then the new rebuilt um, town of Hiran will accept them. They'll be moved into that. You know, they'll be able to stay in that town. So one way or another, I don't think there's any contradiction between saying that their way of um, living. That's a, a black. That's a black comply. I mean, they, they won't be. They, 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 there is. They, there are co committees that uh, uh, won't allow Arabs to be in this uh, uh, in this community uh, towns. Saying that Arabs can live in Hiran well, is a town doesn't complied. exist yet, so it's hard to, to speculate. But yeah. I can tell you about Hura when I went to Hura, and it's entirely populated by Bedouin. Right. It was. It's a. It's like a reservation, Hura. If you recognize it in terms of American context, it's. It's a town that was established in order to house the Bedouin. It's an urban town, and as Amir said, it's in the lowest socioeconomic bracket in Israeli society. So it's the most impoverished um, town. I can so tell you that the houses that, there are much nicer than mine. I would kill for a house like that. It's much better than the house that I currently live in. Yeah, you are. You are. You are welcome to move into Hura today. I, I wouldn't because it's about 78 letters a year there, and because the tribal intertribal rivalries um, mean that it's not the best place, certainly for a Jew to live. Okay. I would be persecuted uh, there. I, I, so I think yeah, there's actually another level of yeah. complexity that we need to discuss yeah. the intertribal rivalries I, I, I would, the Bedouin. In okay. that there are, there is an, an other levels that we have to discuss here. Okay. okay. I, I would like to call off the celebration of this uh, development uh, development uh, plan. I mean, we, we actually know that this is a regular budgetary allocation that are being disguised as, as a plan. I mean, that it, it compare, it, it's, it's uh, comparable with saying that, you know, uh, the uh, um, uh, American economy has now a new plan and it's basically its budget because we are talking about regularly uh, uh, budget allocations for education, for etc. So it, there is no any uh, extra money coming in except maybe uh, extra money for law enforcement and more uh, uh, enforcement efforts um, in order to make sure that Arabs uh, who were evacuated from their own villages won't uh, come back again. So uh, the, this plan is and basically tasking the very hostile uh, uh, authority for resettlement and development of Bedouin with impl the implementation of the plan uh, means a lot. It means a lot and, and, and we are very skeptical of this plan. I believe that this plan will uh, make a difference. And this very authority, which has 100 employees, none of them is an uh, Arab, none of them. And this is the this is the authority that is going to implement this development plan of, of of the Bedouin community, and the terms, of course, are very colonialistly, developing the Bedouin and and uh, and bringing modernity to the Bedouin. Dove, there's a, I have a question there's some you, reporting yeah. there's some reporting Dove that yeah. that I that caught my eye, and this was from January, mid January, and it, you say here, sun comes down in Am El Haran. The little girl is picking out her school books from the rubble, others taking whatever is salvageable. Um, you've done a lot of reporting on this topic, this issue. Where do you think the story might go next? Well, that's what I talk about when I mean the human tragedy. It's, it's, it's difficult to see with your own eyes. It really is. When I got there the day, I got there the morning after the, the demolition happened in Imla Hiran, 
uh, to see uh, the women crying. And, oh, what you what you didn't show them is that when I got there the day of Mahiran, okay, one Bedouin man uh, was killed. I, I don't want to get into the whole story of how his death occurred, okay? Yeah. But. And that, and that was uh, a big story, and, and there's still repercussions now, but I didn't want to get into that sure, because that was mid-January, yes. well, well, and we're now to, in mid-February. Yeah, 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 what I want to get into, the children of the man uh -huh. who was killed that day, okay, were alone playing in the rubble of their own home, okay, and technically they will actually have to pay for that demolition, yeah. according to the law. Not technically, they, they, have, they do have to pay, yes. right? They have to pay. They do have to, right. So this is, what I, this is what I talk about when I mean a terrible human tragedy every time. And again, the onus is on Israel to prevent these things from happening. But, and also I want to go back to the say, the Israel Supreme Court, okay, notice that the building of the new town that we built on Umar Hiran, okay, is meant to be for religious Jews, okay? Now, Israel Supreme, the Bedouin are allowed to move to that village. The other thing is, why would they move to a religious Jewish town? It makes no sense. The Supreme Court understood that. And, it's, and, and it reprimanded the state for saying that uh, the Bedouin could move there, even though it was unlikely that they would. Okay, but Umar Hiran, I think it's a special case in, in this matter. But, uh... All right, I guess. Well, I'm going to leave the last word with Malika. This is a sentiment from Taha Hayat on, on Twitter. Was, uh, just tweeted this and not too long ago, saying Bedouins don't need to be integrated. They just need the same rights as their European Jewish neighbors. Sentiment from one person on Twitter. Amir Dav. Nadia, Emmanuel, this has been going on for so long. I appreciate you bringing new energy to the conversation and helping our audience around the world understand it better. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Take care.